Well, welcome to the 2016 version of Breakfast with the Cinephiles. And I'm back in the New York groove, or Cinephiles groove as it were. Yes, um, Michael Foltz is back for the attack with my cohorts in crime here. We've got Andre Joseph and we've got Jeff Galishaw. And we are enjoying this lovely breakfast provided by one Dr. Joseph, Andre's dad, who is not only great with teeth, it looks like he's great with the uh, the skillet too. Yes, indeed. <laughs> yes. So today we are going to, uh, as we're um, enjoying this lovely brunch, we are going to delve into the superhero films of 2016. So why don't we just jump in and tackle the first one that came out this year, which was Deadpool, I believe, right? Yes. I believe so. Yes. You know, Valentine's. Mm. Which seemed very appropriate and kind of <laughs> effed up too, right? Yeah. Well, it is a love story at heart. <laughs> That's true. That's true. So. Yeah, not your typical James L. Brooks kind of romance, but it was workable for the time. Yes. Um, I think that this was the movie that Ryan Reynolds had been trying to put through for years and years. As soon as he got um, the role of Deadpool in Wolverine Origins... He was hammering home the fact that he wanted to bring Deadpool as a solo character to the screen. And it was a chore. It was a chore. And somehow it didn't deter the fact that the, the, the box office returns of Green Lantern and the horrible critique didn't hurt that either. I mean, I think also with this film, he had something to prove, if not to an audience, to himself. So that he could show, because I think he really wanted to be, you know, immortalized on screen as a superhero in some role. And I feel like this plays more to his sensibilities because, uh, okay, Blade 3, for the load of crap it is, he's memorable in it. But he's basically playing almost the same type of character, you know, obviously with higher morals and without a mask. But everything is like one-liners action scene. Well, one-liners action scene. And he comes off better than Jessica Biel. Uh, mm. Oh, you mean in Blade 3? Yeah. Mm. Strangely enough, I actually like Blade 3 more than Blade 2. Really? really? <laughs> I didn't like all the references to pro wrestling in the uh, in Blade 2. But you'll have, like, Dracula as a bodybuilder. Yeah, that's, a that, that's fun. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that, I admit, was a mess. So and then you, if you watch the Blade 3 DVD commentary, when Dominic Purcell is introduced wearing like the, you know, uh, Hot Topic, uh, you know, <laughs> vest and jewelry that he's wearing, the commentary is Jessica Biel going, mm, he looks good. And then you hear Ryan Rolls go, really? <laughs> <laughs> and she's like, yeah, yeah. And what's funny is at the time that she was making those comments, she was dating uh, Chris Evans. Yeah. And that was Chris Good. Evans before Captain America, so I wonder if he was trying to pump up for it. And then she marries like this little worm, <laughs> Justin Timberlake, so I don't know what... Who was also rumored to be up for the Green Lantern role. As was uh, a guy we'll be talking about later, Jared Leto. Jared yeah. Leto, Justin Timberlake, and Ryan Reynolds were the final three of Green Lantern. Yes, I know Bradley Cooper did a screen test for it. <laughs> really? Yeah, and then there's, of course, the comedic version they wanted to do with uh, Robert Smigel and Jack Black. <laughs> In terms of what Ryan Reynolds brings to the screen as Wade Wilson slash Deadpool, I think he approached it exactly the way it was supposed to. I wasn't a big Deadpool reader, mm -hmm. but just being familiar with the Marvel Universe, you know what Deadpool shtick is. You know that originally the character, when it was written by Rob Liefeld, that... that jackass artist that made Deadpool famous was that he was just a normal like samurai mercenary there was nothing special about him but then writer Joe Kelly is the one that made him the quote unquote merc with a mouth mm. and made him a sillier character spouting one liners and nonsensical uh, you know uh, non sequiturs within <laughs> uh, the comic pages and I think that's what except for the look that Rob Liefeld came up with really the character's essence was created by Joe Kelly. And I think that's what Ryan Reynolds uses absolutely to a T in the film. And it's directed really well too. Like yeah. the action sequences are great. You know, one thing I gotta say too is because they kind of dragged their feet for years on this. And I gotta give credit to Fox for actually going the R-rated route. Oh, because yes, yes. The X-Men films have been 
and trying to like little by little they want to go to that edge but they couldn't because they're still trying to get the kids in there finally they take a chance on a more adult character and one to break the fourth wall which was very key to the film's success by you pointing that out i think that might make deadpool revolutionary in the terms that you can make comic book films with an r and still make a boatload of cash well you also got to remember like right before production they also took a heavy chunk of the budget out which is why they joke about it in the film like why we don't see the rest of the x mansion why is this uh finale taking place on a warship <laughs> you know an old retired one so i also have to give it to them because they have an initial plan set i think out. The, the, the budget was like 35 million right it wasn't much it wasn't much but they still took a healthy chunk out of it and so i think they took like 10 million out of it last minute but they still stayed true to their vision <laughs> well it's interesting too that um, the one named character that you can identify outside of Deadpool in there is Colossus. <laughs> so my guess is either Marvel or Fox had a list of characters they could and could not use to the writers and say, you can use this guy, but you can't use this guy. And it was also interesting that for up until then, Colossus was an actor. I forgot what his name is, but he was an actor. Here he was a CGI character, essentially. <laughs> yeah, more yeah. like who we remember in the comic book. Yeah. Yeah, staying in that form. And right. But that actually threw me off a little bit because I kept thinking Colossus is not going to eat breakfast in his organic metal form. I like that was your one problem with the movie. I, no, it wasn't my problem. It just kind of threw me off. Like, And also that the other X-Men happened to be Teenage Negasonic Warhead. <laughs> Uh, which was an obscure character, and I could be wrong about this, and I'm sure our fans will go ahead and correct me on this, but I believe that was a, a, a little creation, a little side creation of Grant Morrison, who wrote X-Men for a while, who is also went on to do, who actually does a lot more DC stuff, nah. but he had a very successful stint with Marvel for a while with X-Men and Marvel Boy, but that's, you know, <laughs> uh, it's a, that's a little side thing. But I think overall, I think... Uh, uh, I think Ryan Reynolds' Deadpool was a big success, and it, the box office showed it made almost eight hundred million. Yeah, yep. probably the biggest profit of any comic book movie this year. Yeah, and he ended up. I think personally, he made between. They said fifty million, but I think it was closer to a hundred million that he made from that film. Damn. Because he ended up putting a lot of his own money into it. That's Dreams it. do come true. Yeah, mm -hmm. well, and you know what? I'm glad because Ryan Reynolds strikes me as a good guy. He's a funny guy, strikes me as a good guy, and uh, you never hear. I mean, the worst it's ever gotten for him is his divorce from Scarlett Johansson, and even that didn't seem like that bad. <laughs> I feel like, I mean, he does it in the past. I don't know if it's for money or he hasn't made the best, like, choices, cho choices but, you know, at least, at, least, at least here it shows his passion and his interest, and it paid off for him in the end. I also think it's interesting, it wasn't successful, but I did know there was this kind of uh, underground, well, I shouldn't say underground, <laughs> I should say online movement. I'm so old. <laughs> uh, an online movement to get him to host Saturday Night Live as, as Deadpool. Deadpool. Yeah. That would have been that would have been the one Saturday Night Live I might have watched, <laughs> since I don't watch the show. But that I might have watched. It worked with Betty White, but couldn't work with Deadpool. <laughs> yeah, and I got also credit to the writers, uh, Rhett Reese and uh, Paul Wenick, who mm -hmm. wrote Deadpool. They also wrote Zion. The real heroes of the film. Yes, mm -hmm. they were absolutely the real heroes. These were the fans. These were the guys that really brought this guy to life. And I think if it wasn't for them, I don't know how this would have turned out. I think these guys, uh, the two gentlemen that you just mentioned, I think they can write their ticket for their next film, I think. Besides the Deadpool sequel. Yeah, of course. And I'm glad they're coming back for it. Yeah. Well, you'd have to be out of your mind not to have a sequel for an $800, $800 million movie. Well, they weren't sitting around waiting for their Zombieland 2 script to get made. Mm. Well, the less said about that, the better. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's go on to the next, I guess, officially the first... Uh, summer tentpole movie, as they like to call them these days, which Maybe would be polarizing. Uh, yeah, oh, Batman oh, versus Superman. <laughs> that's right, because I almost said the other one, the Marvel yeah, one. Yeah, that's to I was like, uh, that's polarizing. Uh, no, no, that uh, no, that would be yeah, that would be <laughs> Superman versus Batman, the Zack Snyder extravaganza <laughs> that also made 
I think it, well, the final toll was somewhere around $860, $870 million. And it's interesting that you can have <laughs> almost a $900 million grossing film and have it be a disappointment. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's the age we're living in now. That's how much money is spent on it in advertising and everything. Especially yeah. two years of putting it together, going through all the Ben Affleck controversy. You would think it would be like Star Wars level you know, success, but surprisingly enough, it wasn't quite that. It was the execution. It was the writing. I'm not saying it was a bomb. I'm not saying that. I think visually there's some stuff in there yeah. that takes your breath away. But that's about it. Let's go with the good. Because okay. I know you guys are really, you're really chomping yeah. at the bit to start, you know, start in on the negative. But let's start on the positive. Like I said, the visuals were breathtaking. He can set, he, Zack Snyder can paint a picture. Yes. I mean, that is without a doubt. Also, Wonder Woman was fantastic. Yeah. Even I'll though you, she I'll was barely that. in it. I'll scowl Godot. Mm. But she was fantastic. I didn't Every bad time about she was on mm. screen, I kind of held my breath a little bit. Which is the opposite for Ben Affleck. And <laughs> I agree with that. But here's my, here's my opinion on that. Okay. Ben Affleck, great Bruce Wayne. Absolutely horrendous Batman. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> Andre? Uh, the more I think about it, the more he was like a real dick, like a real Donald <laughs> Trump type of Bruce Wayne this time around. Interesting. I mean, this the man's hatred for Batman is like that deep. You mean hatred of Superman. Superman. Oh, Superman. Unless he hates himself. Yeah. <laughs> well, Which hey, could hey, also hey, point hey, to something yeah. else. <laughs> but no, I mean, like, I, I this is my issue with Batman versus Superman, and it's been my issue since day one. Everybody's complaining about, oh, Ben Affleck's going to be this horrible Batman. He's a horrible actor. And then we have those, True. those on the other side saying, no, well, everybody complained about Michael Keaton when he was Batman. Look how he turned out. The problem wasn't necessarily... Still not that great a Batman, but go on. Well, okay. But, <laughs> but um, Another the episode. <laughs> was never necessarily Affleck in the role. I think it was just everything around it. When you started hearing... Wonder Woman's going to be in the movie. Cyborg's going to be in the movie. Aquaman's going to be in the film. <laughs> it's like Call of Justice League. You know, why does it have to be But But when you saw the film, though, you knew it shouldn't have been called Justice League. It should have been basically Batman versus Superman. Although I was kind of expecting Aquaman and Flash to appear at the end to help out with Doomsday. I was kind of expecting that. But when it didn't happen, I'm like, okay, that makes kind of sense that the big three take care of Doomsday. Although the creation of Doomsday was Doomsday in and of itself, that was horrible. Yes. Uh, my biggest complaint, it's like I have a giant complaint, <laughs> and then I have like sub-complaints <laughs> after that. My biggest complaint is the absolute disaster that was Lex Luthor. Yes! Because yeah. at first, mm -hmm. everybody is going to say, when they see that casting of Jesse Eisenberg, the first thing they're going to say is, hmm, Okay. I didn't see him as that, but that's out-of-the-box casting. We'll see. He's a good actor. Let's see. And then you see it on screen, and you're like, why is he playing the Joker? <laughs> or the Riddler in Batman Forever. Yeah, why is all of a sudden he like this unhinged... But he's basically, if you took the Joker and mixed him with Mark Zuckerberg. Yeah. That's, that, but that's not Lex Luthor. Uh, that's look, somebody else entirely. And give him a Red Bull before each take. Every, <laughs> yeah, or, or put like adrenaline in his heart or something. <laughs> You know, sitting there watching him talk to himself and chastise himself and mumble and do all that. It's like, but that's not Lex Luthor. Lex Luthor is this big, confident, brash bull of a man with the, you know, bald head. And this guy is like Donald Trump, but much more sinister, if that's possible. I don't think Donald Trump has the attention span to be sinister, but that's just me. But you always know that with Lex Luthor, there is something going on behind those eyes. There is some plan. There is something going. It's either to destroy Superman or gain more power. And, and then, like, towards the end, he becomes super philosophical all of a sudden. At the end, he becomes the, uh, the herald of Darkseid. <laughs> Well, what was that? You know, it's like he 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 becomes like uh, 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 the version of Brittany Murphy from that one movie. Uh, <laughs> I'll never tell. <laughs> Don't say a word. Yeah. And then and and then they, to explain his baldness, oh, he's going to jail, so they shave his head. 
it, it was just that was just lazy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's that's what that was almost as bad as oh. having uh, in Spider Man three having Gwen Stacy become a model on a table and, and <laughs> posing for pictures for absolutely no fucking reason. And of course, we have to talk about the worst scene in the film. Martha, <laughs> that's my mom's name too. Yeah, <laughs> it's just like. You're really? Right. What? And David S. Goyer wrote the Dark Knight uh, movies. And it makes it's, no uh, sense because I think David Goyer is a hell of a writer. He's a hell of a writer, and I don't know what the fuck he was I'm thinking. wondering, did Zack did Zach Snyder insist on these changes? Did the studio insist on him going a certain way? It just felt like that whole third act was, let's just jam everything in. Let's jam in Dark Knight Returns. Let's jam in the death of Superman. And just have this huge epic battle and then bring in Doomsday. It was like they were trying to throw everything in, including the kitchen sink, and it was incoherent as hell. And when did Gotham City Metropolis become like New Jersey and New York? That close to each I other. It was supposed to be like New York and Chicago. Like. It, it was it's, like... it's supposed to be New York, Chicago, yeah. <laughs> so... And uh, Or no, I, I think Bob Kane said that he likened Gotham more along the lines of Philadelphia. In terms of, and, and that was supposed to be the distance too between the two cities, not like right next to each other, because that's fucking stupid. Yes, exactly. Amongst other things, though, the fight scene when they're invading, I guess whatever, towards the end, the warehouse, that was actually well filmed. You I, mean between uh, the fight actually between Superman and Batman? No, the uh, oh, Batman trying to Bat rescue, yeah, trying to Martha. rest and rescue Martha. Oh, okay. And, okay. You know, obviously, stupid things like. Superman, um, knowing where Lois Lane is at every second, but he couldn't tell when his own adoptive mother is getting kidnapped. <laughs> Don't you guys think, though, that the ca the very casting of Ben Affleck was distracting? I thought it was very distracting. I think, I think, see, Even that with the Batman helmet, his fucking jaw is huge. <laughs> uh, and he always looks constipated. Constipated <laughs> and unhinged. <laughs> Batman, to me, strikes me as a fairly cool character that hates evil. Now, granted, you had to deal with Christian Bale in that voice for three episodes, well, or three, two, uh, well, two, two, two really. movies. <laughs> but, to be fair, I thought Christian Bale was still the best Batman. But see, here was also what Christian Bale did that Ben Affleck didn't do. Whereas, with Christian Bale, his Bruce Wayne didn't seem like he could be Batman. In this film, you could see totally Bruce Wayne being Batman. Right. And so, it's like... If anybody else found out a secret, it wouldn't be that great of a shock. It'd be like, okay, I can see that. And to me, Alfred did most of the work in Batman versus Superman anyway. Because he'd just be like, Alfred, fly the plane. Alfred, do this. It's like Rob Downey Jr. as Iron Man. It's like... Uh, I'll tell you, uh, uh, that was another thing that I enjoyed about this Batman. I liked Jeremy Irons as Alfred. I thought he was good. I, I thought that he didn't take... Was it just me or Batman was taking a little bit too much shit from everybody? Maybe that's why he was so constipated and psycho. <laughs> well, he should. <laughs> Your mother's name was Martha, too? <laughs> uh, we're blood brothers. <laughs> I can't kill you if your mom's name is Martha. But then, you know, you talk about, like, also the way Marvel handles their universe building so well and setting up for other characters. This did the worst job of all of that. I think it's yeah. because Kevin Feige and Marvel itself are very disciplined. They're like this. You know, one leads to two, two leads to three, three leads to four, and don't stray off this. We've got, that's why, what's their name? Um, uh, the female director uh, uh, bowed out of... Um, Eddie Jenkins. Yeah, uh, no, um, I have, um, the one from yeah. the uh, the Martin Luther King uh, biopic. Yeah, yeah, Mc... yeah, yeah, that's why she backed out, because Marvel pretty much said, this is not your movie, this is a Marvel movie, and you've got to follow along these lines, and she didn't want, I think that's another thing that What's-His-Name had a problem with from uh, Ant-Man, um, Ed, um, Edgar Wright. Edgar Edgar Wright. Wright. You have to follow a plan. You have to be disciplined well, about yeah, what you're doing. Because he wanted to make more of a heist movie with a superhero in it. Or, but then, was it because of James Gunn's sensibilities that they trusted him with Guardians of the Galaxy? Well, James Gunn was a comic book fan in the first place. Okay. And mm -hmm. you can see that all over that film, too. And I think that he 
they must have just read exactly what we saw on the screen, which was, yeah, he's going to do the, uh, do a little bit of this and do a little bit of that, but he's not going to stray off the path in these different things. Okay. And I feel that's the problem with DC Entertainment. They stray off the path, which is we really bizarre because Jeff Johns, who went from the one of the head writers at DC of their comic books to now head of DC Entertainment and responsible for movie development. He's a hell of a writer, but I don't think he's much in terms of whip cracking. I right. think Kevin Feige is a whip cracker extraordinaire, and he tells everybody, this is how you're doing it. He tells Kenneth Brownell, we're going to do it this way. <laughs> You know, the and still not make a good movie. Um, <laughs> I actually thought Thor one was better than Thor two. Well, that's not that hard. <laughs> um, but I mean, the whole problem they made money though. They're always going to make money. Not necessarily. Hulk Hulk didn't do so well. Yeah, okay. The Lewis Letterer one. Yeah, but they haven't made a satisfactory Hulk, and it's like I don't think you can. Because I don't know about that. I think you can make a satisfactory. I don't know about a good one, but you can make a satisfactory. I think it's one. just the issue with Hulk itself is why you're getting movies that are very uneven. I thought the Ang Lee film was very good, but nobody wanted to see the Absorbing Man, you know, as David Banner. Well, I mean, also, well, not to go off on another movie, but Nick Nolte didn't help. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's kind of like a raving homeless guy. <laughs> exactly. It's like that is not who I want to see as my villain. It's like it's like you p just picked up a random homeless dude and was like, "Hey, this is your father. He's also the villain. He used to be brilliant." <laughs> well, yeah, but they, I think what they were trying to say is is the gamma effects kind of wear down the person that you are and kind of break down your mental stability so, so and is that the excuse we're going to use for nick nolte too in certain yes. films yes we are <laughs> just go back and watch rich man poor man all right uh, Let's go to <laughs> but is that all we have to say on uh, batman versus superman because what do you guys feel about when you got to preview the heroes that Lex Luthor had all that research for? Not only did he have research, but he had everybody's ready-made symbols, too. Like, like, he's sitting there going, well, this will be cool for this guy. No, it won't. Yes, it will. <laughs> um, I mean, Jesse Eisenberg channeling Gollum, by the way. It was just, it was, I mean, it didn't make me excited for it. I mean, I could see how it's like, yo. Know, it might uh, be like a little Easter egg for future fans, like, hey, wait till you see these guys. But it wasn't really like the most revealing footage, because it's like, okay, we see the Flash, we see him in a convenience store, then we see all these blurs, and it's like, that's the Flash, and it's Cyborg. We just see this half man kid, really. Screaming. Yeah, and like, ah, and Joe Morton just looking into the camera talking. Yeah, I was <laughs> watching like, that, I was like, Holy crap, is that Joe Morton? I was like, this seems more like a horror film footage than anything. And then, of I course... I like the Aquaman. I thought the Aquaman was pretty cool. Oh, we were supposed to get more of him because they featured him in all the posters and the toys, and you only get one shot of him. It's like Jack yeah. Cousteau discovering a new fish. It's like, oh, look, and there is the Aquaman. Yeah. <laughs> That's what it felt like. I thought that was cool. And, well, the Wonder, well, Wonder Woman, who we saw throughout, was really the only, like, interesting one that was cool to watch the you know see the old archive photos from like world war one or whatever it was steve trevor, in the steve trevor yeah chris pine is yeah i thought that was interesting that was nice it i think Zack snyder's problem is the same problem that quentin tarantino has you've gotten all this power and you have nobody to rein you in whether it's an editor that you trust or a studio head there's nobody to go whoa 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 stop the clock this is, we've got we've to think about this more. And you'd figure that David Goyer would be that type of person to say, hey, this is not my first rodeo. Well, now I think that's going to change after this movie. Well, yeah, because now they seem to be letting There was a lot of backlash. Speak. A lot of backlash. Well, because they just don't want Zack Snyder to be the solo director in charge of everything. And I mean, I will say... Too many hats. My, my concluding thought about Batman vs. Superman is that there is room for improvement. I was going to say, the so, problems are correctable. Yeah, there, there's not a complete disaster that it's going to fall off the rails, but there's still a lot of work to do. Well, let's put it this way. When it comes to visuals, Batman versus Superman is light years ahead of what Green Lantern was with Campbell oh, as yes. the director. Oh, God. <laughs> I mean, the visuals there were just downright depressing. For as much money as went into that film, 
So at least we know that we're going to get with Snyder behind the camera, we know we're going to get a good looking film. And I can't yeah. even look at Will Smith outside of movies and go, well, he seems like a decent guy. No, he doesn't even seem like a decent guy because he's raised those two horrible children. Well, I'm not going to go there. <laughs>